Hello everyone. Uh, today we have our next video in the crash course about iceberg. We have Alex again. Hello, Alex. Hey, everybody. How's, how's things? Well, thanks for having me back. Uh, today we will have a demo about the uh, iceberg. Uh, Alex will go through the demo with us and it will be somehow we get some practical things about how iceberg is working. And I will give the stage to Alex now. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate at Dremio. So in this exercise, what I want to do is actually spin up a data lake house on your laptop with um, using Docker. OK, so basically this exercise, if you scan that QR code when I did the introductory presentation, this is going to be very similar to that exercise. Well, this is just show you sort of how easy it can be to work with Apache Iceberg tables and how, yeah, how, how little configuration it really can need depending on the tools that you use. So essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin up this Docker Compose file here. So again, this is the URL. Um, I'll make sure I share this URL with Mustafa so you can put it in the video description to where you can find this Docker Compose file. But just to kind of walk through it real quick, um, this Docker Compose file. So if you have, if you you would need Docker to do this exercise, you can get that at Docker.com. And it's essentially, what Docker does is, uh, for those who may not be familiar with Docker, um, is Docker allows us to create um, basically a container. And a container is essentially, think of it as like a little mini virtual computer that works on your computer. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but for today's purposes, that's probably the simplest way to think about it. And a Docker Compose file allows us to describe which little mini virtual computers we want to create. So in this case, I'm creating a environment that has three containers or three little virtual computers. Okay, and I describe that all in here. First is the catalog. So that's gonna be our Nessie catalog that provides us with sort of Git versioning for our iceberg tables. Okay. Then there is my storage. So that's going to be my Minio storage, which is a object storage very similar to Amazon's S3. Okay. So that's going to be there. So that way I can use that. And then Dremio, my query, my data lakehouse platform that's going to act as my query engine, as a place where I manage my users. So, so I can manage the access they have to data, connect my other data sources, and so forth. So basically, once I have this file, so literally all you have to do is create a Docker Compose file, okay? And then you would just copy the code you see over here into that file, okay? All of this is already configured and ready to go. So literally, all you have to do to spin up the, the data lake house on your laptop is you just type in Docker Compose up. And what this does, it's going to read the Docker Compose file and then basically build the environment that I specified in this file. So I hit that, and that's going to take a moment and start uh, generating the environment. Okay, so it's right now what it's doing, it's it's pulling the images that I specified. So in each in each of these things, I specified an image, which is a blueprint for the virtual little mini computer that it's going to create. Okay, so I'm creating a Nessie computer, a Minio computer, and a Dremio computer. Okay, and so it's pulling those images, it's making them all set to go. So that's going to take a moment. Okay, so it's going, it's going. Okay, it looks like uh, Minio is up and going. So the first step I'm going to want to do is make sure that my Minio environment has buckets for me to store data in. Okay. So again, Minio is what's referred to as object storage. So if I go over here to localhost, so localhost is my computer, and I'm going to have Minio running. If you use my Docker Compose file, it's going to be running on port 9001. Okay. So you see, there's there's Minio. Okay. And the way object storage works is a type of distributed storage. So when I work with it, it's going to feel like I'm working with a normal file system. But really what's happening is that theoretically, it's taking the files that I write and read from there and it's distributing them, distrib distributing them across a network of computers. So that way I have the redundancy to make sure that those files are always accessible um, and also to handle the scaling when there's multiple requests coming from many different places. So it, it provides a very scalable way. Uh, object storage is a very scalable way to store data. So the the pass the username and password is going to be admin and password okay and that's set over here technically that's set right here in the docker compose file i think if someone does know about um menu we can consider like is this free for on premise <laughs> exactly. something like this yeah or open source like for people they need to test similar idea but they don't need to have a uh, cloud correct uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Minio has many. Uh, I love using Minio for tutorials because it does allow me to have that S3-like storage locally. Um, there are plenty of companies who basically they they need to have on-prem storage because uh, for security reasons or regulatory reasons, and they actually use Minio 
uh, in place of uh, like an S3 or an ADLS. So it can be used in production. It can be used for experimentation. It can be used for all those things. But as far as like what is the username and password it comes in, that's all defined in that Docker Compose file. So that way you know where that comes from. Then I hit log in and see now I'm logged in. And then see right now I have no buckets. So my buckets are going to be sort of like units in which I can store data in. So it's kind of like you have buckets on S3. So if I go over here, the buckets, I can go over here and I can create a bucket and I will create a bucket called warehouse, which is, that's just going to be where we store our data. Okay. And that's it. So now I have a place to store my data. So when I think about my lake house, what do I need? I need somewhere to store my data. Okay. We're going to need to store that data in a particular format, which is going to be parquet files. And then we need a metadata to track those tables. That's going to be Apache Iceberg. And then we need a tool to a catalog, which is going to be Nessie, which is currently running. Um, there's no UI for that. So it's just a server that's kind of currently running in the background. And then we're going to have our query engine, which is Dremio. Now, Dremio, we can access from localhost 9047. Okay. So now when I first go there for the first time, it's going to ask me to create a user. Okay. So there we go. I'm going to go create my admin account. So oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, and, um, username. Uh, Alex Merced, password, I mean, email, we'll just put uh, demo at alexmerced.com. And then password, we will do, um, I'll just do password 2024, password 2024. Okay, cool. Now I'm in my Dremio environment. So basically, this is my data lake house platform. So from here, I can now connect my catalog. So basically, to work with Iceberg, I need to connect a source that supports Iceberg. So that's essentially any object storage source. So let me just make this window a little bit bigger. OK, so just Nessie, which is what we're going to use in a second. First, let me just show you the other ones. But I can connect meta stores like Hive and AWS Glue. I can connect different object stores. I can connect different databases and lots of sources and kind of organize them all here. So what I'm going to want to do today, though, is I want to connect my Nessie catalog. OK, so that way I get all those Git-like features. So I'll name this Nessie. Now the Nessie endpoint is going to be HTTP, no, not HTTP, because it's running out of my local computer. It's no S, HTTP, slash, slash, catalog. And the reason I'm able to use the word catalog is because the way Docker is going to work is that when I see this container name, these, cat, these different uh, containers can then see each other using the name. So basically, my Dremio container can see the Nessie container. that These computers can see each other using the name that I gave them. So I can say, hey, catalog. Um, and the port is it's like, I think it's like 192. Yeah, here we go, 19, 120. And then it's uh, slash API slash V2, okay? And all of these directions are also right here in this guide right here. Again, I'll provide the link for the video description, okay? Now, in this case, since I just been, spun up a default plain vanilla Nessie, there is no authentication. So I'm gonna just choose none for the authentication. So again, the, this provides the access to Dremio to the catalog, because again, it needs to access the catalog to discover where the table is located. So back to the presentation, we had a catalog that had the links to the different uh, tables. But those tables need to be stored somewhere. So Dremio also needs access to where those tables are stored. So to complete this connection, I have to go to storage and then provide it the storage credentials. So in this case, um, it thinks it's S3, but really we're using Minio. So I would just use my the username and password that I specified as my access key and secret key, OK? And then we have to provide it a root path for, for where it's going to store the data. So that'd be slash warehouse, the bucket we created. And then the thing is that it's we're not technically using S3. So Dremio needs to know that we're using a S3 compatible source. So I can use these connection properties to do just that. So I take this property. I'm going to set that to true, OK? So fs.s3a.path.sell.access. That's just going to make set it so that we knows how to read the paths um, at the endpoint. OK, so that's going to be catalog. So let me just change action. That's going to be storage. Because if I take a look at the Minio container in my Docker Compose, that one's called storage. So see, Nessie was called catalog. Minio is called storage. So that's why I'm able to use those names, because I'm using Docker Compose. Just the, if, if I were just spinning these containers up independently, I would have to probably use IP addresses. Or if I were to you know, create my own network on AWS, and then I would use the IP addresses in these cases. Okay, and then this this here just turns on Dremio's compatibility mode. 
So that way he knows that it's using not S3, but an S3 compatible source. And then that should be it. Only thing, other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the encrypt connection. Because again, this is on my local laptop. So I don't have SSL set up on my laptop. So that's going to, I'm going to turn that off. I hit save. And that should connect. Just take a moment. And there we go. There's my source. So now I'm ready to go. So now what I can do is I can go create a table. So I can go over here as simple as and say, hey, I want to create um, create table Nessie, because that's my source. That's the source that I connected. Nessie.table1. And we'll just say it has an ID field, which is an int and a um, an ID field, which is an int, and a name field, which is a varchar. OK? And I can just then run that query. And it's going to create that table. OK, so that now this iceberg table is being created. OK, so it's writing all that metadata. So now if I go then back to Minio, I see there's my warehouse bucket. If I open it up, I see there's table one. So I see table one now exists here. And I can see that the metadata exists right now. I know there's no data because I just created the table. I haven't inserted any records yet. But I can see, hey, there's one metadata file. So there's the current metadata file. And then there's like the manifest list. But there's no records. There's no manifest in that manifest list. OK, so I can see that. Now let's insert some records. So if I go back to Dremio and let's insert some records. And I'll do I'll do multiple inserts. So I'm going to say, hey, insert into. OK, and here's the thing. Maybe I, maybe eventually some of my names might get really long. The nice thing about Dremio's UI is I can just go over here, grab the name of the table, and just drag that right into there. So that way it creates uh, there. And I can actually specify, because I'm using a Nessie catalog, I have branching. So I can actually create different branches and manage different branches of that, that data. But I can say, hey, insert into, and I'm just going to just get rid of the branch statement for now, table one, values. And then we're going to say first one will be one. Alex, and then two, uh, Mustafa. Well, actually, should we do that in single quotes? Mustafa. Uh, there we go. And then we start that. And the cool thing is I can actually put in multiple queries into this editor. That's, an, again, just the, the niceties of, of using uh, the Dremio UI. So I can go back, go back to the same table, and let's see that table one. Values, and then actually, let me change this. Should be an integer. I'm gonna get an error in that query if I left that there. Um, three, and then I'll put my wife's name, Becky. Okay, cool. Now, if I run this query, so I can see it's running the first query. So I can see it's doing that, and I can actually see which queries is running. And then as soon as this one's finished, I can actually start looking at the results by just clicking right over here. So I say I can click there, and it says, "Hey, insert two records." I can then click here and I can see. So that's those are two transactions. So that means there should be two more manifest files or two more metadata files in my object storage. So if I go back to Minio, I go back to the main area, I click on warehouse, I click on table one. See now these 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 folders. So remember I mentioned that Dremio uses compatibility mode right off the bat. So instead of just having this data folder that splits everything into partitions, it's automatically just kind of hashing them. So that way the files are well distributed to avoid that throttling on S3. OK, but the metadata is still in the metadata folder. And I can see now there's three metadata.jsons, OK, because it was one from when we created the table, one from the first insert, another one from the second insert. OK, so every time we create a new transaction, we're creating a new metadata file, which is going to point to another snapshot. So see, we have three metadata files, and we have three snapshots, because we've done three changes to the table. OK, and then these are the manif these Avro files that don't say snap. Those are the manifests. OK, so you, you can see that, hey, like, and the cool thing is, I can then go connect that same Nessie catalog to Spark or to Trino or to Presto, and they'll be able to see the same exact table and query it, just like Dremio can. So that's the beauty of, of Iceberg, that you have that portability of, of your table. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. So mm -hmm. after we insert the first transaction, first insert, mm -hmm. we have a snapshot of the table after this, uh, like it was empty. Now we have one transaction, which is two records. Mm -hmm. And then we can go to this snapshot. We will find only two records. Then we have inside the third record. We have a new snapshot now. And the mm -hmm. snapshot, the next new snapshot has 
previous two records plus the third one. So we can have we have multiple snapshots for each transaction. Correct? For yeah, for each transaction there was one snapshot. Okay. So basically, so the create table that was one snapshot. This transaction right here, one snapshot, and then this transaction right here was a third snapshot. So we have three okay. snapshots. One for every time the table changes, because it's never going to change the old files. So it's always gonna, there's always going to be a need to write new files every time the table changes, which means we need to update that metadata, which means a new metadata file. So each change is one snapshot file and one metadata file. And later we can query specific snapshot. That's... Yes. Okay. But so we've done the three transactions. We've got our three snapshots. We got our three uh, manifest lists. Um, but the cool thing is, and now what I can do is I can add other sources. So for example, I can go over here, and so I can add this sample source. Okay. Now with the sample source is technically another object storage, but I could, it could this could be as easy a Postgres or anything. So for example, when you want to do ingestion work. Okay, instead of writing a Spark pipeline, which I can still do, I can still connect this Nessie catalog and then do all my ingestion through Spark. But I could also do it here. I can just say, hey, you know what? I would like to take this. Let me actually go. So this is an object storage. I'm going to go in here in my object storage. Okay. And then I see that in this data set, there's this weathers data set that's right here. Okay. What I can do is it's a CSV file. I can now promote it. So I just click on this little file right here. That recognize it as a CSV file. And now I can read that as a table. So now I could do something like this. Create, let me just make, yep, create table nessie.weather as select star from and let me go grab the weather table. So I don't have to type these long names. Okay. Okay. Yep. So see, there it goes. Okay. And then now I have that as an iceberg table. So I theoretically I could just do, so and I can do insert into's, merge into's, all sorts of just do it all through SQL and move the data from let's say my my SQL database or my Postgres database. I can just do it all here on Dremio. And then again now I if I go over here, I click on warehouse. I see there's the weather table. Okay. There's all the data in a parquet file. Okay, and if I were to download this Parquet file, so let's see if I can download. Actually, I don't know if it'll let me download it. I'll try, um, just because it's a container. Um, download. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. So let me open up that folder. Okay. And then I'm going to bring this back to VS Code. And if I were to take that Parquet file that was written by Dremio and just drop it into here in my VS Code. Okay, so there's the file. And see, it's all the weather data. Okay, so that all works out pretty well. Okay, so bottom line is again, I can convert my data sets into Apache Iceberg. I can ingest into Apache Iceberg pretty easily from here. But as you can see, working with Apache Iceberg is can be pretty easy. Now, far as like if you were working with it in Spark, if I go back to my Quick Guide section or this this website over here. Okay, I also have resources for if you were connecting it to Spark. So if you were connecting, uh, you know, your your catalog to Spark, it would look something like this. So if I go over here, I have iceberg, uh, iceberg with PySpark examples. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, generally you're gonna look with PySpark code. That's gonna look kind of like this. So this would connect, you know, the Nessie catalog. Would provide you'd provide all these settings to configure the catalog, and then you'd be able to run SQL going forward. So it's a little bit more configuration which is why sometimes it's nice is once it's set up, it's set up and you just run your SQL. Um, but then you also have the option of using Spark. You can connect Flink. We, I, have, I have another blog uh, on the Dremio blog where you can actually see like how to use Iceberg with Flink. So if you go to dremio.com slash blog, there's a few really key tutorials I'd like to point out here. Um, first one is going to be on the second page. I write a lot of blogs. Um, so this is the this is the exercise that I linked to in the previous presentation, where you basically do what we did today. You're going to spin up the lake house on your laptop and, uh, you know, play with it. But then we also have uh, where's the Flink one? I think it's a little bit older. There we go. Like you, with this tutorial, you'll actually ingest data using Flink into Iceberg tables. If you want to see how they use Flink with Iceberg, um, and there's also a few with Spark. Like right here is a deep dive into configuring Spark with Iceberg. There's a lot of really great blogs here to show you how to use uh, Iceberg with different data tools. 
Um, so I also recommend reading through some of those tutorials as well. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, bottom line is that once you have iceberg tables, they work with all your different tools. And it's pretty easy. As you saw here, it's just writing SQL. And then, you know, when I'm, when I'm using Dremio, it just feels like I'm just using a normal data warehouse platform. I can then, again, I have this wiki where I can just like start writing documentation. So I can like create spaces to organize my data. So if I were creating like data products, I can create like an accounting data product, a, um, let's say marketing data product. And then I would curate views on the data here. So let's say I wanted to, let's say I have in my accounting folder, I create like a bronze silver gold kind of setup. What I can then do is I can take that weather table um, at main. Main. Okay, let's try that again. Sorry. Um, I don't know. This is usually his uh, select star. That's fine. Far from. There we go. Okay. And then let's do save view as. And then I would save it here in accounting, the bronze. Again, weather raw. Okay, perfect. And then what I can do from there is that I would, let's say I can go here and I can actually give access to the space to like different users. And then those users can then see this and then they could go in there and someone else can then go take that raw view, curate views for the silver folder and then curate views for the gold folder. So basically they would only see the spaces that I give them access to as the admin and they'd be able to work with the, the particular data and curate those different products. And they'd be able to create wiki content over here so that way you can uh, document that data. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility here and you can see all the different queries and how what queries came in, who wrote those queries, what's going on with them there. So a lot of, lots of flexibility. And all of this is actually can be integrated with DBT. So far as automating a lot of this work of curating your views, you could just do that using a DBT or pretty much any orchestration tool that can connect to Dremio. Um, so it's pretty uh, easy to orchestrate all that SQL to, 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 to make this turnkey. I have a question here mm -hmm. about um, uh, the views. Is it cached after like if we have many uh, developers or analysts run the say they are running the same query? Is this will be the result will be cached so we don't hit the table again? Yeah, yeah. So what's going to happen is that Dremio has a feature called the columnar cloud cache. So what's happening is that every time that if it sees the same query being run over and over again. Uh, it's caching uh, Parquet files, portions of Parquet files in, in the memory on the nodes in the cluster. So that way those future queries, one, it won't have to request from S3 again, which saves you the network request fees. Um, but two, also speeds up the queries. So you're going to have that. Um, but secondarily, you also have a feature called reflections. So like, let's say I have like a three layers of views and I have like a join, right? Joins are a great use case for reflections where I might be joining three tables to create this one view that's denormalized. Now, in that case, I don't want to really be processing that join every time someone queries. So what I would do is I would go just to show like how that would look like. Let's say I have this view here, this thing here. I would click this little pencil and it takes me to this screen and there's this thing called reflections here. I would click like raw reflections and I'd hit save. And what that would do is it actually creates, essentially what it's going to do is going to create a, a uh, hidden Apache iceberg table of the results of that join. So that way in the future, if someone queries a join, it'll use that instead of running the query. But at the end of the day, the end user doesn't have to go query like a separate materialized view or anything like that. They would just query the view like they normally would. They're just going to notice it's faster. And the cool thing is I can go over here and I can actually specify which columns I want included. Like if I don't have every column, I don't need to materialize every column. Depending on what queries I have doing, I can choose which columns to materialize, how I want those columns sorted in that representation, and how I want it partitioned to speed up the performance of the type of queries that I'm receiving. So uh, you get that granularity, but um, and I can create multiple reflections, and it'll use the one that would best speed up that particular query. So if I have two categories of queries coming into the same table, instead of having to create two versions of the same table and say, hey, query this one if you're doing this, query this one if you're doing this, they can query the same table, and I just have different sets of reflections behind it 
to handle the different queries and Dremio will handle the thinking. So that with the end user just queries the table, they don't have to think through, hey, there's five versions of it and my query's gonna be faster on this version of the table. Um, making a lot of the, the, the end use for the analyst much easier, but also a lot of the execution for the data engineer much easier as well. Yeah, it's clear. I think this would be very helpful when we need to build some reporting for analytics later. So having this reflection and some layer of caching would help to get the result fast and to still reduce the effort for the... Yes, and on that note, uh, on, with reflections, I mentioned like BI dashboards. Like there's this other type of reflection called aggregation. That does That's what you would want to use for BI dashboards because that actually aggregates all the group by results for different aggregations. And you can choose which dimensions and measures you want to you want to um, aggregate, and it'll basically manage that for you and makes. And then on the data set, there's a Tableau and Power BI button that immediately just basically make that connection and read it in Power BI or Tableau. Yeah, I think this is a very important feature. I think a lot of BI developers will like it. Yeah, yeah, no, this is very popular for BI. Like. Dremio is by far probably like whenever anyone has like wants to do BI in the data lake, that's where that's like that's like definitely the Dremio's like sweet spot where people are like, but the, a lot of the customers, um, they start with BI and then they start realizing like, hey, I can do a lot of other stuff with it and th their usage grows. And a lot of people are now building using this as the centerpiece of their data lake house because it gives an end user a really nice interface to all that data that's very similar to using something like a snowflake or whatnot. Yeah, it's very nice. I like it, by the way. <laughs> this part okay, good. Especially. Yeah, because yeah, because like I know like sometime uh, when I have to um, to provide some design for uh, Quio Analytics and the developer will need somehow of caching layer and just need to design this in some way very easy. So I think this will be very nice uh, opportunity for them. They can write the SQL, they can write some aggregation, and they can export it or get it to Power BI or Tableau to be very nice and easy. Yes, and I'll, be, I'll point out one more thing that I thought that, that, that you mentioned it. As far as making it also easy, let's say you have users who are not really good with SQL. Like, let's say I create this data set here. Do, 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 do. And let's say, like, I should, I should have changed one setting when I uploaded the CSV file. Actually, I think I, well, I'll come back to that. But let's say I wanted to like change this field. Like, let's say, uh, actually, there's a better example. Let me use a taxi. Like what's the header? Uh, well, let's say you wanted to create like uh, this field, but times two. I can click right over here and I can do a calculated field and they don't need to know SQL. I can just say, hey, I want, you know, this field times two. Um, so I want this field times two. Okay, and I can say apply. And it's automatically going to write the SQL for me. Um, in this case, uh, uh, I because mean, thing, yeah, I understand the idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but uh, yeah, but yeah, it will it, reduce out of headache for the BI tool rather than the BI tool to do this in the side. So it will get it directly from the Dremio or the SQL engine. Exactly. So it makes it easier for people to curate their own data sets and whatnot. In that case, I forgot this. When it was a CSV file, all the fields were text, so I can't multiply text. But, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. clear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it has a lot of cool stuff. It makes it the easiest way to get started with Iceberg. So like literally we saw that we got started with Iceberg in like just a few moments. We were writing Iceberg tables. We're moving data into Iceberg tables. So I, but the, again, the beautiful thing is that let's say one day you don't want to use Dremio anymore. You don't have to rewrite all your data. You just connect your catalog to a different tool. And that's the beauty of Iceberg, that basically your tool, your data is always under your control and is always movable to whatever tools are the best tools of that day. Because in the future, there's going to be other tools. And you're going to want to use your data and you don't want to have to rewrite all your data just to use those new tools. And that's the beauty of using Iceberg as your sort of center of your data landscape. In your book, I like the figure, which in the book, which me, which mm -hmm. talk about, we have multi layers and this is a table format. So we, we, we don't encapsulate the table format with, uh, with execution engine. So everything separated, you can use different execution engine to the same data, not like property data warehouse. You have to use the data warehouse with its file because they load that internally for some proprietary formats, mm -hmm. but open source tools like table formats make it easy. I have Iceberg. I can use Spark to query or process the data. I can use yeah. Dremio. I can use any tool. I, I I don't have this coupling of the SQL engine with the proprietary storage. file for the, for yeah, storage for each exactly. part, which I like it to be honest. This is the freedom, which we like, I think it's important to have this in, in data lake in general. 
Yeah, especially for like larger data sets because it gets really expensive to move much and much larger data sets. When you start getting to terabytes, petabytes, like that, 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 those migration costs really, really add up. And also, like sometimes I feel having this flexibility because in the data area, because in my architecture work, there's different use cases. Not all teams need to use the same data with the same style. So some teams they need analytics, some teams they need DL, some teams need streams. So we don't need to couple them with directly some like proprietary format or storage. Keeping this flexibility and the open source world make it like I think it 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 makes their life easy for for encapsulate or um, like I mean onboard different use cases to the same data set. A hundred a hundred percent. We have in a lot it allows each team to kind of use the tools that work best for that team. Um, and use the practices like basically all it does is say, Hey, we're going to store your data in this format. We'll let you decide how you're going to work with that data. Yeah. And basically it just makes life easier for, uh, makes life easier for the tool. Cause basically if we all agree on what the tool, what the data should look like, that it's parquet files using Apache iceberg metadata is much easier to optimize for the same data set. So that way all tool sets are faster for your data because we're all optimizing for the same target. Um, and we all learn from each other in doing so. And it's, a uh, it's 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 a, it creates a very virtuous cycle um and how everything kind of works together so it's it's pretty it's a pretty exciting and it's definitely been a privilege to be part of evangelizing this sort of new cutting edge space yeah i agree with you <laughs> okay um do you have anything about this demo now about this part um i mean aside from that we we saw that basically i can work with iceberg tables i can write iceberg tables um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's basically is it. And I mean, that's the beauty of it, that it's so simple. Like basically I just spun it up, connected my catalog and basically I was able to write and read tables, uh, like I could with any other database and, and I'm not even using, I'm not technically using a database. I'm using my data lake my, and my data lake feels like I'm just like working with like snowflake. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of a one, having a standard format like Apache iceberg and two, having a data lake house platform like Dremio. When you combine those two, you create a really powerful, um platform to 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 center your data around and again the beauty of it is that again one day you decide to stop using dremio your data is safe your data you just move your data to the next tool you want to use um you know uh and that's 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 the beauty of it uh, although you know i definitely would believe if anyone sits down does what we did here today and plays around with dremio a bit they'll really like what what they see it has a lot of really cool bells and whistles and it does really make the engineer and the analyst life a lot easier in a lot of ways I think uh, because I have a lot of, of uh, audience from the mm -hmm. EMEA area, especially Middle East in my channel, we have we don't have, I think, cloud providers in the Middle East. And one of the major part which I always think about is if you have on-premise data lake and you don't have the benefit from the cloud tools, you have Iceberg open source, you can utilize Iceberg, you can use that any tool, SQL engine you like it. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you mix very important part like most of the people they have they don't have cloud benefit to use because of security or regulation for example in egypt i'm from egypt we don't have um we don't have cloud provider in egypt so we all working on premise okay mm -hmm. so building data lake plain on hdfs is not easy so having iceberg uh, tool with with these features it makes our life easy and special adding this benefit of sql engine uh, which could be like compatible with any on-premise or I mean open source. It's it's agnostic. It makes mm -hmm. I think sense for for special these use cases. A hundred percent, hundred percent. We're also very popular for Hadoop modernization, uh, just because we are one of the most mo more modern tools that do connect to uh, that is able to work on top of a Hadoop cluster. Makes again so basically, basically just, literally just by putting Dremio on your Hadoop cluster, you're gonna start noticing performance benefits. And then if you start using Apache Iceberg with your Hive Metastore, you're now you have a Iceberg data lake house. Um, and then what happens later on, if there is a cloud option, you can connect that cloud option to Dremio and still have both all, you're still using the same interface. So it makes it really easy to transfer to the cloud later because people don't have to change what they're using. They don't have to change how they're working because they're just using the same interface. You just suddenly just behind the scenes, move the data and it's all still being visible through Dremio. So a lot of people really like using that for one, accelerating, uh their on-prem data lake and then in the future sometimes moving either to object storage on-prem like minio or moving to cloud storage like aws and they can do that without disrupting their end users because this abstracts away where the storage is 
Yeah, yeah, I, feel, I agree with you. I, it will help a lot and it will reduce a lot of effort and provide a lot of performance age for this part, either uh, through the statistics which I expect provides or through the file format uh, uh, methodology, which we will reduce the operation for compaction, vacuum, all of this stuff, which iceberg uh, offers special with Um Yeah, uh, that's very nice. Uh, uh, do you have anything you need to say at the at the, at the end of this uh, video? Yeah, I I have a bunch more resources for doing this. So if you go to youtubecom slash Merced data, that's my YouTube channel. Um, there is a playlist for those who want to go further deeper and see iceberg used with a variety of different tools. If you go to here this playlist um, and look for scroll up, uh, Apache Iceberg Lakehouse Engineering, here's a playlist where I'll use iceberg. <laughs> I use Iceberg with a variety of tools. So you'll see it with Dremio, you'll use it with Spark, and you'll see a few other tools uh, being used there with like Polars and whatnot um, to just kind of get more hands-on work with the Apache Iceberg Lakehouse and seeing it in work. So uh, yeah, that's that, I will that. add this. I will add these links, uh, mm -hmm. this link and other links in the description. So anyone need to uh, anyone needs mm -hmm. to check the, the the links or this channel i will add the link and uh, i i highly recommend to to check this uh so yes we have two videos only but here you have more so you can deep dive mm -hmm. more about this topic and uh, yeah is there any other things you recommend for anyone who needs to get more details about this part yeah I think you can always just reach, uh also just <laughs> feel free to reach out to me on linkedin i'm on i mean go on reach out to me on linkedin um, so if you're interested in like, uh, if you're interested in Iceberg, I can give you some advice regarding Iceberg. If you're interested in Dremio, I can definitely connect you with people to help you kind of, um, you know, see what, what you're, we have, we have a lot of solutions. Uh, well, well, we have tech teams over there at Dremio who are, we, we do free consultations to see one, what are the challenges that you have and to see one, if Dremio makes sense for your situation. And if not, what does make sense? So that way, at least you walk away with a solution for whatever is challenges you're. So we're always glad to have that conversation. So just reach out to me if, if that's a conversation you want to have. But otherwise, yeah, feel free to reach out to me for any iceberg questions, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, I always like helping people get to the get to the data lake house because the data lake house has a lot of value to offer. And when people get a lot of value from your data, it benefits all of our lives because it benefits the services that we receive, benefits the AI and ML models that fuel a lot of our services. So benefits our business decisions. So the, the, the more I can encourage people to kind of get their data to a better place, the more all these other things improve as well. And, and the world's just a better place. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I think um, it was very nice uh, walkthrough for Iceberg and Remu. Uh, I hope it will not be the last time we have you no, no. on the channel. We will come again and have other use cases. And uh, I thank you for your time and uh, you spent today. I know it's weekend, but yeah, thanks for That's your time good. and joining us today. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice rest of the day and uh, have a nice weekend, Alex. Bye. Bye. Me too. Bye, everyone.